Hi everyone. Is everyone joining? Please let me know if you can hear me as well. Hey y'all. Okay. Okay, good. So I'll go ahead and just start. So my name is Morgan. Hi, my name is Morgan. I'm the um, author of the syllabi of the syllabus this month for Sula by Tony Morrison. Um, I'm not sure who all has been in one of the live chats before, but this is basically just a forum for us to discuss part one of the book tonight. So we're only we're gonna, we're gonna split the book into just as you know, just that is just as it's written. And so I think that's like from 1920 to like I want to say like 1957. Can't remember right off. But we're gonna um, split the book into so we'll have two live chats. And tonight, you know, really anything is up for discussion. We can talk about anything, no questions or comments are off limits. Just go ahead, no matter how far along you are in the book as well, go ahead and engage with us. Um, this is really just an open forum again for us to just kind of process the book because Sula is definitely one of um, Toni Morrison's heavier reads. And I think it'll be really good for us to be able to, to, to get into all of that together. And so really just process different themes and motifs and different things that happen in the book together. Um, I'll just pose an initial question and we can go from there and see if anyone has anything that they wanna put on the table. And, or you know, I can continue to pose topics or questions, but we'll just let it flow organically I know that we'll have a lot of good discussions. I've been looking in the Facebook group and I've seen a lot of short discussions happening. So I'll give people some more time to just kind of check in. Let us know you're here. Again, no question, comment is off limits. This is a very, very intense read. So we definitely need to have an open conversation to make sure that everyone is able to get what the message that they need from the book. Um, so let's start with a comment that I actually saw in the Facebook group earlier this week and it also goes along with something that was mentioned in the syllabus, but one of the key themes of the book is girlhood, black girlhood specifically. And one of the comments that I saw in the Facebook group was about, hi, one of the comments in the Facebook group was about friendship, specifically Sula and Nell's friendship. So, I guess that'll be that's a good starting point just for us to kind of unpack that and the weight of that friendship and what is their friendship a common theme that you may see in friendships amongst black girls or is it just as bizarre as the rest of the book you know how does their childhood relationship kind of set the pace for their relationship moving forward and how reflective of um how much does their relationship reflect kind of like the average black girl friendship? 
during during use. And also just, you know, feel free to chime in, change the topic, however y'all want to go about this. Hi. I have my book here too, so when I'm glancing to the side, I'm just glancing at my notes and at my book. And we'll keep, I'll add on to that initial topic. Um, Sula, I think a lot of people would say that Sula is kind of a key text in um, fiction writing for black feminism, womanism. So, so far, what aspects of the text do you think, um, I guess, align with feminist thought, black feminist thought specifically, if, if you agree with that at all? You know, Sula is a very heavy text and there's a lot of um, death and despair and, you know, just throughout the entire novel, readers are just kind of left feeling very hopeless. So do you agree with people who would say that Sula is a, kind of a, a, a staple in Black feminist literature as far as fiction goes? And again, if you want to start with a completely different topic, we can do that as well. Okay, let's keep going. So one of, um, another large theme that we, we saw throughout the entire novel is just the 
the presence of motherhood, the role of mothers. And um, I think Morrison did a really good job of portraying the complexities of, of black motherhood specifically. So in tying everything together, or at least the black motherhood and the two previously mentioned topics, uh, black girlhood, black girl friendships, and the kind of overarching themes of black feminism. Let me rephrase the question. So, um, you know, when we think of like black feminist literature, we often think of like these Yeah, when we think of black feminist literature, we also, we always had like these key texts that we would recommend. So, you know, if someone was to say like, how do I um, tap into, you know, begin to learn about black feminism, we have like these key texts that we would suggest like black feminist thought, um, maybe for the more, I guess, seasoned reader, voice of the South, just these key, like um, Audre Lorde, Sister Outsider, these books that we know are very critical of just the world that we live in and they view things through the lens of black feminism but these books are typically very academic in nature and they're they would be classified as you know non-fiction text but when it comes to the world of fiction toni morrison is seen as a black feminist writer and sula being one of her more popular texts is often regarded as a form of black feminist fiction. So just based on what you've read so far, would you agree with that opinion or would you completely dispute it and say like there's nothing feminist about this book or maybe it's coming or yeah, I do see how it's how it's feminist. That's what I mean. It's it's just it's kind of Sula is viewed as a, a fiction text that has a lot of black feminist themes in it and is very key for formation and learning black feminist ideals. Did that make sense? If not, let me know. Mm. And what does Bell Hook say about <laughs> about that? That's interesting. No problem. Yeah, yeah, I'm really interested in what Bell Hook said. I I know I was reading, I didn't see, I know I saw one critique of Sula that talked about, um, okay. Yeah, I saw a critique of Sula. I can't remember exactly what it said. It was kind of wild, but it did have to do with representation. And it was, it said that Morrison basically did a very poor job. Ooh. Um, yeah, it was tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, what part? What part are you on? Like, where where have you gotten? Because I I think that one thing Sula does it's like it's almost like blow after blow with <laughs> with different things that happen in the book. It's it's almost just like <laughs> okay, are we done yet, Tony? What's going on? 
But um, I think, yeah, there it is easy to, to hope and to want more for Sula and Nell, but it's almost inevitable. I think you, you reach a point where you realize that tragedy is inevitable. Okay. So oh, that's absolutely ridiculous. Hmm. Can you elaborate on that, on the gender norms portion? I saw your message, Josie. I'm sending it to you now. What um how are you all dealing with the the deaths that have happened so far? Okay. Look, only on the second or third chapter, he still didn't. He still sing, sing a little bit. Let me check something interesting. She said she really identified with Sula. Men come and go, but friendship with other black women is more precious. Why well, did not think that Sula would not have sex with her husband? Look, only on the second or third. Oh, did I do it again? Let's do a single, single little bit. Took it over. No problem, no problem. Yeah, we're doing we're just doing part one today and then we'll we'll wrap up the part two in a, in a little bit. So, you know, this is a really interesting comment. I don't she challenged me, your I am challenged you on if you would stay friends. You know, that's toward the end of the book, isn't it? Yeah, that's in there. I believe that's in there, like later adulthood. Probably. If you're talking about the the, the sleeping with the um, husband. And you said your aunt said she identified with Sula, like Sula the text as a whole or Sula like the one character. Um. 
Um, up to 27, 1927. Part two begins at um, 1937 and 1939. So we'll, we will break it up just like that. About, okay. <laughs> okay. We got too many. We got too many screens. You have to take one of your cameras yeah, off. <laughs> Did I, yeah. I do this every time, guys. Oh my god! You know, I forgot that the um, I forgot that I was logged in from the last live that I did. That I have to log out because it keeps me logged on my computer. Okay. What's the name of your baby? This is Kamaya. Hi, Kamaya. Is she enjoying Sula? You know, she just woke up. I thought she was gonna sleep all the way through, but I think she wants to get in on the discussion. Okay. You have too many screens. You have to take one of your cameras yeah, off. No, it's me the background. Okay, sorry, I was watching. Hi, right, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope everyone has a okay. My camera's over here. Copy of Sula. So you were asking about the friendship between Nell and Sula, but mm -hmm. like I feel like the meat of their friendship happens in the middle of the book, and a lot of us are still at the beginning of the book where they're just meeting. Uh huh. So I feel like the friendship discussion gets real hot towards the, for the second half. Once, once everything really starts. Everything pops. We still try to get over Eva setting everybody on fire. That's what we need to talk about. <laughs> what kind of mama is Eva? And what was Tony going through when she wrote this shit? Because I was not expecting it to be this sad. Exactly. So I remember like really thinking like what what's what's up with Eva and as far as her um killing. What's his name? Is he's blanking? Uh, Plum. Plum. I was just like, you know, it's and then I I read, I was I, I read some blog that said that basically this was to show us how love can be smothering, specifically mothery motherly love can be smothering. Oh, okay. So I I still don't know how to take it. Personally, I was trying to see what you know, what people, what people thought about that. I was just shocked because oh, so we 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 opened the book with Shadrach, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm just gonna preface this. I am really bad at remembering character names. Yeah. I can read a book, I get the context, I can comprehend the book, but for the life of me, I will never remember every character's name. Um, and for some reason, I wanted to mix. Like, I was like, how is Shadrach different from Plum? Like for mm -hmm. some reason, I kept thinking that they were like parallel. Either they were the same character, they were parallel characters. Cause she does this whole setup for Shadrach, and then you have this like big ending for Plum, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. okay, like what 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 was the connection? Mm -hmm. Let's see, mm, somebody brought up. Somebody's asking about this. You want to add it to the screen? I can't add it. Somebody brought up, um, they compared it to mothers killing their children, like present day. I mean, infants and toddlers, what's that word for like, like our mothers in present day killing their children? I, it, like the, the, the way the setup towards the death of Plum even happened, it was like, and Hannah found the black spoon. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, so he was doing crack? <laughs> Was crack a thing in 19, what, what, what were we in, 1922? 19, yeah, like 21, very, 22, very, this is the very, very beginning. He was doing something, he was snorting something. And so, and it's, it's not like he was living nasty, but like even still, like the, the child that you cared for, I mean, we get a later explanation in the next chapter about she felt like he was trying to crawl back into her womb and mm -hmm. she didn't have the space to carry him. Which I I guess in theory makes sense that like he essentially was going nowhere in life. I felt like and he 
was shriveling up. With, I guess, with the whole, what's the name of the city they live in? Medallion? Medallion, Medellin? yeah. Medallion, Ohio. Medallion. I mean, the city is so sad that I, I guess for me, in my mind, is that why can't there be some sort of saving? But nobody gets saved in Medallion. You know, like, this is the bottom. Yeah. And so if, if you can't if you can't sustain in the bottom, the, the next place to go is death. Mm -hmm. But there's so much death in this book. It's from the death day. after death after death. That's why someone was saying that she's just and it's, like, what happens? and it's like what morbidly was going on in Tony's mind. Yeah. That like the deaths are always so like passe. Oh my god. Yeah, <laughs> they're wild. Somebody is asking about why gentrification has such a big explanation in the beginning of the book. And how should I expect this to set the scene of the book? Well, I think it sets the level of sadness. Mm -hmm. And well, for me, right? Because well, we all live in like, we've all seen now in the 21st century what gentrification actually means. And so you see, like, I, for me, it kind of sets the tone of like disparity, but there's still this potential for liveliness. In that the city does at some point become revitalized, and because it becomes desirable to the same people who saw it as undesirable because of what these undesirable people cultivated it to become. So maybe I don't know. And the gentrification theme, I think, really kind of rounds itself out by the end of the the end of the book. It's it, I think for me that the, that theme was made clear like once I finished reading. Like throughout it, it's almost like it's mentioned at the beginning and you don't really have a clear idea of its role throughout. But once you hit the end of it, it's kind of like, okay, I see. I feel like she was always going to kill him. Remember when she, when they were starving and she took him to some dark place and in the house and she said she resolved to end his misery once and for all. Yeah. Hmm. Did I miss that part? Um, <laughs> what was that? Interview? She was talking about Plum. I don't remember that either. Was that what? What year was? Um. Yeah. I mean, I be reading thick skimming though, so I don't quite remember where she quoted that. Page thirty-four. Okay. We all have the same copy. Oh, when she was taking the shit out the bow. Sorry, don't want to curse from the baby. When she was taking <laughs> the bow <laughs> out the butt. <laughs> Yeah, because Plum was having problems with the Okay, okay. But wasn't she talking about boy boy? Oh, was she saying, was she resolved to end his misery once and for all by taking, by removing his bow, like his constipation? Mm, but yeah, okay. So I think she's saying that, like, yeah, she was talking about the vows, but maybe. This person is saying that like they got the that, that kind of foreshadowed Plum's death for them. Mm. I don't know Plum, the the I, I knew she was going to do something. I just didn't think it was death. I thought there was another <laughs> proven. There was a lesson to be had. Some mm -hmm. sort of pain, some sort of I'm gonna like suck like I'm gonna like sweat the drug addiction out of you or something. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting that passage to be like she suffocated and then lit this nigga on <laughs> fire. Like it's just kind of wild. And then for her to purposely kill her son and then her daughter Hannah died by accidental fire. And then for like Eva to turn and see Sula and think something negative of Sula. It's like you you the one that lit your whole own child on fire. Like the apple don't fall far from the tree for her to be inspired. You know what I mean? For her to be intrigued. Which which goes to like the whole who is good, who is evil, you know, how we you know 
it was very easy for everyone to justify their own pretty twisted actions in this book, but cast aside someone else. What does it say? Can we speak about Suicide Day in Chad Rag? That was kind of eerie, especially what happened at the end of parts. You know, got to the end of the book already. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> Coco done got to the end of the book already. <laughs> Some of us are still in 1927. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk about Suicide Day and whatever happens in part two. We'll just go talk about Suicide Day, but it can't flesh it all the way out. Um, I can read what. Uh, so, this is the book I'm talking about by Bell Hood. Oh, yeah. Okay. What now? What was her critique? Right, because she she's talking about we haven't gotten to the end of the book, so I don't want to spoil it. Okay. She says even though readers of Sula witness her self assertion and celebration of autonomy, we also know that she is not self self actualized enough to stay alive. Her awareness of what it means to be a radical subject does not cross the boundaries of public and private. Hers is a privatized self discovery. Hmm. You're not, you are not left with her sense of power. Instead, she seems powerless to assert agency in a world that has no interest in a radical black female subjectivity, one that seeks to repress, contain, and annihilate it. Sula is annihilated. The reader never knows what force is killing her, eating her from the inside out. Since her journey has been about the struggle to invent herself, the narrative implies that it is the longing for selfhood that leads to destruction. Those black women who survive, who live to tell the tale, so to speak, are the good girls, the one who have been self-sacrificing hardworking black women. Sula's fate suggests the charting, that charting the journey of radical black female subjectivity is too dangerous and too risky. And while Sula is glad to have broken the rules, she is not a triumphant figure. She is like so many other black female characters in contemporary fiction, has no conscious politics, never links her struggle to be self-defining with the collective plight of black women. Yet this novel was written at the peak of con the contemporary feminist movement. She says, given the power of Sula's black female author creator, Toni Morrison, why does she appear on the page as an artist without an art form? Is it too much like treason like disloyalty to black womanhood, to question this portrait of, dare I say, victimization, to refuse to be seduced by Sula's exploits or their ignorant outcome, or ignore their outcome. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I, I, when I hit that part, I was like, well, damn, sis. Oh. <laughs> you like anything. That's awful. Like, I, 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 I take a, a lot of issues with bell hooks, but I'm kind of like, hmm. She's she's saying that Sula, and I'm I'm only got into 1927, but she's saying that Sula never owns her power. Mm -hmm. That she's constantly in seek, and that's why she does things out of this place of seeking, but she never cut connects it to a larger understanding of black womanhood. Okay. She never had a political agenda behind it. And I guess for where I'm at the book, it does seem like Sula does, but I'm thinking, oh, well, Sula's just young. And so she yeah. does things haphazardly without okay. thought. And so that Sula, like, really, so so Sula's like a radical character. She never gets to own her power. Just kind of like aimlessly doing things. Okay, that makes sense. Given where we are, yeah. I think she looked at Sula that way because Sula didn't react the way they thought. And so she knew she possibly had met her match. Can you add it to the screen? Hmm. The comment you just read. Okay. That's from Brittany. I think she looked at Sula that way because Sula didn't react. Oh, you're talking about Eva. So Eva looked at Sula that way because she didn't react the way she thought. So she knew she had, I mean, I agree. I think she saw her own self in Sula, but rather than, there's no love in this book. <laughs> yeah. No warmth, there's no empathy. There's no, oh, this is my offspring. And so she's 
like me in some way, but you just see, somehow you don't see the evil in yourself, but you see the evil in Suda. I thought that was a very hypocritical moment. So that, I, I found myself forgetting who the like mother daughter pairs were often because it was such a callous kind of, it was such a callous read. There was just a lot of very dark interactions and I had to always, I had, I had notes. I was like, okay, Hannah is her daughter. Sula is her daughter, but it was, it was, it was hard to connect it because there were no like loving bonds, as you said. Rachel commented about Shadrach. There's a lot of love for Shadrach. I, I guess I haven't gotten to the point where he comes back up. Can you add that one? Mm -hmm. um, I know this book is set so far back, but this I one? sad. Yes, no. There's a second one. It says. I know this book is set so far back, but I think it's sad that Shadrach had no true support, medicine or therapy for his trauma. He was let out of the hospital knowing he was having these psychotic symptoms. But that's like the racism of the time. Like this book is set during the Nadir, which is a, the darkest point of black American history. And there's all this domestic terrorism happening to black communities. Um, and you kind of have the beginning of like veterans affairs and so. I mean, it, it was it hurt, but it was definitely like true to the times. They like we barely getting mental health support now. So in nineteen twenty, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's also just very standard for like the bottom, you know, residing in the bottom. That's just kind of how everything was. But I don't know. I guess I I need to get to the end of the book so I can understand this the heartstrings that are tugging at every for everyone around Shadrach. Because <laughs> it seems to be a lot of emotions are connected to his character. At the end of the day, what does Sula really accomplish? Yes, yeah, she was free. She left Medallion, which is more than Mel did, but what did that freedom give her? Thank you, love. Uh, I don't know, I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> trying to answer that without Trying to keep part one and part two separate. <laughs> is that a part two question? It's my answer is like my initial answer was like, did did she accomplish anything? Because that's I think that's what Mother is suggesting that she didn't accomplish anything. Yeah, that in essence, Sula really isn't any better than now. Yeah. And oh, that's that's definitely it. I mean, that's like that's clear as that's made clear as day at the end of the at the end of part two. It's <laughs> Zula and Nell are really two feet in the pod, and they're, they're both, you know, one and the same. What do we take from Hannah's death? Was like what was the symbolism of that? That was death by fire, right? Yeah, like she fell asleep after putting something on the stove. Mm -hmm. And what are the Deweys? This is Dewey one, two, and three. Does she owe her feminism? In, like, cause Sula doesn't really stand for any other person other than herself. So this, is she, is she, she's not a feminist, you know, she might have a sense of self or a belief of her sense of self. That means that she gets to, she feels like she should have access to certain things in certain worlds, but I don't think mm -hmm. that that sense of self ever transfers to a sense of community. Because I think she also sought to have power over other women. But I don't know, does anybody have any questions about what they've read thus far? How are people feeling? And what time of day are you reading this book at? 
because I was reading the book first thing in the morning, but all this death was messing up the rest of my day. Like I would have to put the book down because somebody would just die. Like, like the little boy, who was, what was the little boy's name? Chicken Little? Chicken Little? <laughs> His name really was Chicken Little. Yeah, I think so. I think it was Chicken Little. And and yeah. like I had to go back and read the passage because I was like, did she really just swing this boy into the water? Yeah, yeah. And Tony was like, we <laughs> we were we were just having fun, and then plunk, he sunk into the the, the lake. That was yeah. That moment was twisted. It wasn't, and it wasn't a nail who Nell's reaction to that. Oh, and then they went to the funeral the week after. Yeah. Girls are scandalous. <laughs> All right. What is this comment from Nay? Hey, Nay. I feel like Sula pursued all that we often tell ourselves that will free us of whatever. And that freedom, it, it will somehow bring us joy or comfort that we didn't choose an easier or more acceptable life. But in it all, it didn't fit her. And so what? Her fit her, and so and so her freedom for what, and did she really gain from it all afterwards? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think part of that is like because she was so self centered, and does the, like even in modern times, is anybody we know who truly just centers themselves and doesn't like. I get people. I get people don't necessarily want to have to think about community because they don't have to do the work of being part of a community. But like, it's so unfulfilling to be self-centered. Like, yeah, life might be easier, and you might deal with less. Yeah. But like, you look up and you're alone. And you and so that that really becomes evident in part two for Sula. Like, she is dead, just alone. Do you think Sula was a narcissist? And what do you and do you think? What happened with her and Hannah on the train had a part in her personality. Yeah, she's definitely a narcissist. Was it Hannah on the train or was it Nell on the train? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think it was. See, and this is what gets confusing about the book because there's so many parallels. I think it was Nell and her mother who went on the train. What was Nell's mama, mama name? Um, was it Sarah? Did I make that up? I think you did. <laughs> Helene. Okay. Hel Helen. Helene. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They went on the train down to what Alabama, to, or no, they went to New Orleans to visit her, her grandmother, and mm -hmm. that was the only time now ever left Medallion. Am I saying is Helen with the E? Is that Helene? H E L E N E. It's okay, girl. It happens to the best of us. I'd be confusing my characters too, but I I do think the, the that visit inspired is why Nell and Sula became connected because I think Nell saw something eccentric in the same way that she was intrigued rather than eccentric. Because essentially, what Helene did was rid herself of any Creole culture. And then so that one whiff that now got of this otherness, of this mysticalness, of this sort of craziness, because remember who Helen's mother, Helene's mother is, essentially like the town whore. Mm -hmm. And now gets this one encounter with her. I think that's what really drew her into Sula. Mm -hmm. Right, I agree. As I think that I think that trip did give a lot of context into why Nell is the way she is, and also like how much her mother was just trying to hold together, and how much her mom was just buttoned up, and like this super. Mm, what's the word I want to use? Like. Was she conservative? 
But like this sort of air and haughtiness that her mother had was all of a side. And it so easily was undermined as soon as they got on the train. And then even so undermined when they went back to where she was originally from. And then after she comes back, that's when all of a sudden Sula, who's this girl she's been in school with for five years, is of interest to her and they become friends. But what does it mean that they was, how the hell are you swinging a little boy around? You know, like I imagine they were swinging him around on his two arms, like when you twirl kids around and he just plunks into the water and just sinks. <laughs> and no one got to jump into the water to get him? Yeah, and it's, it's is Sula who has more of the like frantic reaction. Nell is kind of like fascinated. There's something wrong with both them girls. Yeah. <laughs> Which that was interesting to me because because Nell, I mean, Sula is painted as the just the, the terrible one. The one who with no like with no morals. And you know, Nell is supposed to be the good girl, but like time and time again, Nell kind of shows us this very dark, dark side to her. Tian, what would you like to discuss with the train scene? Are you talking about when Helene got on the train? You know, and Tony does write in such like flowery, mythical terms that you know what I appreciate is that it's not super dialogue heavy. Like everything doesn't have to be explicitly written out. There are a lot of assumptions that you, the reader are allowed to take. Mm -hmm. and, I think, and, I, and I think it inspires a good conversation because we can all read it differently. And there doesn't have to be this one singular reading of any of Tony's work. Um, but I wasn't really clear on what exactly was happening when they got on the, like that whole thing with her, like why she felt the need to smile at the white conductor who was basically trying to put her in her place. How that, even if, yeah, that was a whack move on her part. And that kind of showed her fear of the white man and how she could put, 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 be put down. Why did that instantly turn the other black people in the car against her? And that whole, the entire, her Helene seeing her such a such a lady because in her town she gets to position herself as such a lady, and you know what this connects to? Y'all know I don't like this feminine movement on YouTube, right? Because <laughs> it centers so much of itself on uh, achieving power over other black women. To say that because I talk a certain way, because I wear my lipstick a certain way, and I cross my legs a certain way, I am better than. Like, I don't care if we encourage women. I don't care if, not even we encourage, but if women like soft, flowery, pink, feminine things, and that's the sort of media they want to absorb, by all means. But I don't, like, care when that message flips to, this is how you curate yourself to be better than other people. And then you set this value system up where you value yourself based upon feeling superior to other people who look like you. And I feel like this is a good example of that with Helene, who essentially a lot of her self-worth was centered around being better than the uncultured people of Medellin. And as soon as she got on that train, that's the first time Nell is seeing her mother outside of their small world in Medellin. And suddenly you get to see her be completely undone by a microaggression. Like you've set your power up over other people and now you ain't got no power. You gotta piss in the weeds with everybody else. Right. What, sis? <laughs> and I think that really changed Nell's viewpoint of her household. <laughs> she said Nell was like, if he died, he died. <laughs> Now is definitely the type to throw a rock and hide her hand. I did not get the, the, the fascination with the scene, but I also couldn't, I couldn't imagine the dress in my mind. I didn't get a lot of the references toward what she was wearing. And, you know, Nell is supposed to be the good girl, but like time in my mind, I didn't get a lot of the references
I didn't understand it. All right. We can uh, wrap this up in a bit. Does anybody have any other points from the first half? I think this is such an easy read. So a lot of people have gotten to the end. There's a lot of people who just got their copy of the book. So we don't want to, you know, because there's a big crescendo. I know it's, I know it's coming because I see all your comments in the group. Oh man, and I think that's such a false sense of self to think that you're better than someone. You know, it don't take much to knock a hoe down. <laughs> you know, like don't ever. It, I think it's such a faulty way of life to go about creating the value you see in yourself based on the power you hold over others. Our modern day women empowerment conference gurus, huh? Like our modern day women empowerment conference gurus. <laughs> no comment, but um, yes. <clears throat> All right, well, we don't want to spoil the end. I guess for the next discussion, we can come back and do 1927. Or, well, there is a part two. I didn't even realize. Mm -hmm. Starts at uh, 1937. Dang, I still haven't read the, I, saw, I have one chapter left. In part one? Yeah, I just have to read 1927. Okay. Eva said yes, but in, inside she disagreed and remained convinced that Sula had watched Hannah burn, not because she was paralyzed, but because she was interested. <coughs> I mean, she your offspring. And that, and that Eva thinks she like had a dream about like a premonition about this happening to her daughter. It's so. Well, if no one has any other. Uh, comments we've, we've had a good chat for the first part one of sula and we will come back it's a short month so i will announce the date that we'll figure out a date next week for which will probably be the last week of february to discuss the book in full and then we can have all the conversation about what we think of sula the woman because I, I think everyone wants to talk about Sula in comparison to now. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thank y'all for joining, and thank you, Morgan, for producing, for hosting sure. this chat, thank and for doing this for this. I hope y'all look here. Oh, my very pretty copy of the syllabus. So pretty, I took it myself. You can buy it. Okay. Well, yeah, when you print it out at, um, you know, this is what your work looks like when they print it out at uh, FedEx, where I got it done at. Okay, well, that's nice. That's good. Yes, we did it. It's real cute. I need to print mine now, okay. <laughs> See, look, they be drafting all this and then don't even go read it. It's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's very good. It's very good, so. If you have a, if you're an insider in the book club, um, you get all the syllabus by for free. You can download it. And if not, they're $7.99 each for the month. This is how they look. Okay. So thank you for your contribution. Uh, and Morgan's been doing all the editing for all the other syllabi. Her name is all over it. <laughs> this is really fun. I love doing it. Huh? I love doing this. It's cool. <laughs> all right, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you for joining. Bye.